Thank you, Klaus, for this comprehensive review. Um, you alluded to, but you did not explicitly talk about the gene that had been discovered by Wieland Hutler uh, that really distinguishes non-human primates from humans. Um, and it's a gene that selectively increases the reproduction cycle of uh, neuro stem cells, so that cells that divide and produce neurons, selectively for those which migrate to the supergranular layers. So this, <clears throat> the major difference between those brains is that we have a, a much, much large supergranular layer compartment. Now, this is interesting because what makes these brains so different from all these artificial intelligence devices is they are linear feedforward networks. But our supergranular compartment <clears throat> is not an output compartment of cortex to motor or something. It's a recurrent network. Uh, both within each area, you have recurrent collaterals, you couple it, so it's like a recurrently coupled reservoir. And they are coupled among each other. This is what triggered my interest when you talked about those large projection neurons and supergranular layers, because they all coupled with each other, all these supergranular compartments in the cortex. If you know your way, one or two switching stations and you come from here to there. So this is a huge recurrently coupled network that produces extremely complex dynamics. And that's what makes a big difference. So there's a single gene. So there must have been a tipping point in evolution somewhere where the supergranular layers had been exploding. And that, that must go along with a jump in cognitive abilities. So it would be interesting to hear whether there's any evidence for such a tipping point. If I may just add to that, so that's indeed, uh, I mean, something we consider a singular feature because uh, many of the uh, connectomic aspects are presented result directly from the size scaling of the human brain. Mm -hmm. But the shift of large projection neurons to the supergranular layers and their elaboration is something we don't necessarily find in other large brains. So if we go to cetaceans, if we go to elephants, they don't possess this rise of the pyramids that we have. So being large is not good enough. No. Um, so you need more than that, and you need mutations of that kind that particularly express in the supergranular layer of the, 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 the neurons. Questions? Left hand. Maybe a question about the connectivity. Because, um, you stress that there is more modularity in the human brain, and that continues to puzzle me because it seems to be the contrary of what I said, the ability to collect together information. But I think in the second part of your talk, you said there might be greater connectivity for the core, for the inner areas. And so I wonder whether that's what you are thinking. I, I, there is a paper by uh, Roger Maas and the uh, iShirt and collaborators showing that the, there is clearly an expansion of these uh, arcuate fasciculus that goes much further in the prefrontal lobe and much, uh, more, much more posterior in the temporal lobe in humans. So that looks to me like greater connectivity. So that, that's a very good point. So in, indeed, um, uh, what I showed in the, in the non-human private brain diagram uh, with the connectivity, where the, the red dots represented the, the hub areas, the core, mm. um, that's indeed something that uh, is more pronounced in the primate brain than, for instance, in the cat or in the, in the, in the rodent brain. And I would expect by extrapolation that this is even more enforced in the human brain. Mm. And that has to do with the fact that, again, we have the prolonged developmental patterns and these are the regions that develop first. Mm -hmm. And who comes first has the opportunity of making as many contacts as possible. Mm -hmm. If you think of this meeting, the people who arrive first at the dinner table, for instance, they can meet many more connections than the people who just dip in at the very end. And so due to the prolonged developmental period, prenatal developmental period of the human brain, there's a much greater opportunity for these core areas to, to mm -hmm. stretch out their connections and to connect. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I completely agree with that. The modularity that I was uh, outlining is something that follows um, more generally from the expanded brain size and mm. from what you would expect to find due to the volume constraints of the human brain. And that's also something that you find. So if you analyze um, functional connectivity, structural connectivity indirectly by diffusion imaging uh, and mm. so on, you find that the levels of hierarchical modularity are actually increased in the human brain as compared to other species, mm. uh, which, which means that Yes, you have more modularity, but then you also have integrative mechanisms in order to offset that, that kind of mm -hmm. so The core is one aspect that's offsetting the, the segregation. 
Uh, the other aspect, of course, is the uh, super granular projection mm -hmm. neuron system exactly. that brings in uh, signals much more powerfully than you would have in other segregated mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. So at least these two mm -hmm. are good thing up. Yeah, way. and uh, perhaps a third mechanism is that what may count is not so much the single neuron connectivity, but if we consider that what are coding assemblies are really vectors of neurons with millions of neurons active together, then it's the joint projection from these neurons that count. And maybe that the increase in the size of the neural assembly may compensate for the reduced connectivity of the single neuron. Maybe as, a, as an additional disclaimer, I mean, we should admit that we have very limited knowledge about the organization of the human brain uh, at the moment, and in particular on the organization of connectivity. So we, we know much more about cats and, and, and monkeys and, and rodents, of course, than we do about the human brain, because we only have indirect measures of measuring this connectivity yesterday. I mean, you made this comment yesterday, and I think it's very well taken. Uh, so we, we have to look forward to developing new methods that can identify human connectivity at the same level or in the same resolution and with the same validity as we have that for, for animal models at the moment. Marcello, you have a question? You, we can say that in the brain, there are a part more religious than other religious part of the brain. So I don't say a gen, genius, a religious gen, but some part more religious than other, I don't know. Because, for example, for language, we say, yes, this party for this language is the follow language. I can't really speak on that because um, I, I think what I, what I try to present is too general in order to specifically point to a seed of spirituality in the human brain. I think we, from, from, from these um, features of expanded complexity of human brain organization, we can grasp the idea that we are capable of more um, general representations than, than non-human primates uh, and that we have a much expanded period during which we're exposed to the transmission of representations um, and i would think this includes religious experience but i could not point to a particular location i, I, I would not be able to say for instance, even that it's located within the core rather than the periphery uh, of the, the global neural network space. I, I, I would be very hesitant to make such a commitment. So we have a few minutes left for general discussion, so you can also address previous talks if you like. And to introduce this, uh, Eve wanted to make a brief uh, comment. It's something else, but it's still important. <laughs> yes. yes. You start the discussion. He insists that this is too different, and so we should have it after the discussion is completely finished before I invite you for lunch. So, questions, please. If there is still something to discuss. Maybe uh, yes. I wanted to un try to answer Marcello's question. It's very difficult, of course, but they, there is a very nice study of the semantic networks of the brain uh, by uh, Jack Gallant and collaborators in California. What they did is have subjects listen to a lot of stories in the magnet in the fMRI and uh, then decide whether specific brain regions respond more to one concept than to another. And uh, so you, first of all, there is a nice discovery that you have a social brain network, uh, which responds to social concepts, including the others, uh, jealousy, etc. And within this network, uh, you can find some voxels that respond to, um, I have it here, actually, uh, uh, the list of words is revelation, guilty, mistake, truth, torment, fate, Jesus, Etc. So it's a beginning. You cannot say that there is one voxel, but there are a few brain areas that seem to care more about this sort of high level concepts. This one is in the lateral anterior prefrontal cortex, for what that matters. <laughs> I, I think it means that our brain puts a landscape of meanings, and some of these meanings, which are religious meanings, may have a particular sign. <laughs> I'd like to uh, ask Klaus, which is a brilliant presentation, 
And I've tried to read your material, but after listening to you, it makes a lot more sense. How much do you know about these features in non-human primates, particularly chimpanzees? And is there a, are there major differences in uh, postnatal development uh, between these matrices and modules and so on between chimps and humans? So what we have relatively good knowledge about is the comparison between mammalian brains in general, um, mice, rats, um, um, cats, um, and some non-human primates, uh, new world monkeys, old world monkeys. And um, what we know, for instance, is that the cytoarchitonic differentiation between a core periphery structure is something relatively recent. So you find it in uh, rhesus macaque, but for instance, you don't even find it in the New World monkey or the marmoset monkey. And the, the reason for how this comes about um, may be through developmental mechanisms. So we demonstrated that if you have a prolonged development, then you get a stretch out gradient of cytoarchitonic differentiation, which then also segregates across the core periphery structure. If you have relatively short development, you tend to intermingle everything. I mean, so in the, in the mouse and the rodent, where you have far fewer cell cycles and far fewer divisions of the progenitor cells, um, connectivity develops not at the same time for all the different regions, but much more simultaneously than it does, for instance, in the non-human primate and ultimately in the, in the human uh, brain. And so that, that temporal separation also helps to spatially separate the brain networks and to differentiate them in terms of the cytoarchitecture and a number of other properties that I alluded to. Um, so yes, we have some knowledge about that in a, in a variety of, of animals. What is not very well characterized at the moment is the um, implication of that for behavior and for cognitive function. And then it has to do with the fact that cognitive tests on animals are very hard to do. I mean, we saw beautiful examples in the, the Robert Stanz at the Hing, but I mean, they're very elaborate. I mean, so maybe <laughs> you should give the story behind the story and tell us how difficult it was to, to train all these animals and how long it took to prepare for these studies and so on. Yeah. So cognitive studies in animals that can ultimately be de de uh, compared to cognitive studies of humans are extremely hard to do and to have objective standards. I mean, it's, it's hard across cultures, it's hard across developmental ages of, of humans, but to do this across species mm -hmm. <laughs> is all but impossible. Uh, and so we have uh, good characterizations of the anatomy, of the physiology, uh, of the computational properties through computational studies of non-human animals, but not so much of the cognitive abilities. And so this is something that should be studied much more extensively. And fortunately, there are a couple of colleagues who who've devoted their efforts yeah. to, to the study, but much more of that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 for the, not for the, yeah. All right. I'm sorry, there is nothing, nothing to do with the discussion. If, it, if it's finished, I would just uh, t tell you that I have here a, a book and uh, you can have this book if you, if you write your, your name and address on, on the paper, which is with it. Uh, I did here in this uh, academy in 2019, uh, a symposium called Who Was Who? Who did what, where, and when? And this was, of course, a symposium on paleoanthropology and prehistory. And uh, Amelie Vianney and myself, we just published the proceedings of, of this uh, uh, symposium of this workshop. And th this is the book of, the, of this uh, proceedings. And again, if, if you want a copy, just write your name. You know, I'm sorry, but that's not out in the discussion. <laughs> Thank you, just an announcement. Thank you very much. That's actually to the topic. So uh, the book is here, write your names. Um, with this having said, we finish this morning session. Thank you to all speakers, to the discussions, and lunch was served outside as yesterday. <laughs>